Hello, I'm Dr. Ola K. Mardiner. Welcome to Discrete Event Simulation. This is Lecture 13, Modeling Basic Operations and Inputs. I will be talking about how to select input probability distributions and also about Arena Input Analyzer and other alternatives. So we will continue talking about what we discussed earlier and we will focus a little more on some of the basics so we'll talk about hypothesis testing. So the hypothesis testing is basically using simple data to reach valid conclusions about the population. And the testing is uh, concerned with um, having two different alternatives. We have a hypothesis H0 and then we have an alternative H1. So we're actually trying to distinguish between hypothesis H0 and alternative H1. And in hypothesis H0, we, um, to test it, we can apply uh, some goodness of fit test, such as chi-squared, or we also talked about kalmogormos vernov test. So in the goodness of fit test, such as chi-squared, H0 is a fitted distribution that adequately represents observed data. So we assume that whatever distribution we are trying to fit, for example, I want to fit normal distribution, then I assume that normal distribution uh, accurately represents the observed data or is a good fit for the data. And the alternative H1 is that that distribution doesn't fit data really well um, and actually poorly fit observed data. So there is only either the fitted distribution is a good fit for the data or it's a poor fit for the data. There is no other alternatives. So when we talk about hypothesis testing, we also pay attention to the conclusion and the actual situation. The actual situation is really unknown um, and uh, but the, we are trying to make a decision based on the data so we're going to have some conclusion so we could make either a correct conclusion that coincides with the actual situation or we can make an incorrect uh, conclusion but it's also very important to distinguish of what the actual situation is so if situation actual situation that really is uh, where we have the data being a good fit, then our hypothesis is correct. And so if our uh, hypothesis is correct, then if we are making the right decision, then we should conclude that it's also a good fit as well. And so in that case, we're talking about the confidence, and the confidence is 1 minus alpha, where alpha is some uh, some level that for our test, significance level for our test. And so in that case, right, we can make a right decision. But it could also happen that the actual situation that the distribution is not a good fit, it's a poor fit, and then we can still make a correct conclusion. Our correct conclusion would be that yes, it's a poor fit. And in that case, we also talk about power of the test. And power test, power of the test means that we are able to reach, right, to, to reach that conclusion in a situation where the alternative is true. So when alternative is true, we would need to uh, reject this distribution as an assumption. And so if we are able to, to actually reject it, then it talks about the power of the test. And so the power of the test is 1 minus beta, where beta is a type 2 error. And so we also talk about error, right, is when we, this actual situation and our conclusion disagree. So in the example where the actual situation is that distribution is a poor fit, but we determine it to be a good fit, we're making type 2 error, and we denote that type 2 error as beta. On the other hand, right, it could be the other way around. It might be that the distribution is actually a good fit, 
but we're making an erroneous conclusion and we decide that it's a poor fit. In that case, we are making type 1 error and that's alpha or significance level of our test. So again, right, we are using the sample data in order to be able to reach valid conclusions about the populations. So whether if you're making the right conclusion that coincides with actual situation or not, as the right conclusion, both of the conclusions are valid because we're making them right from the data based on the test. And what we're trying to do and when we fit the distribution, the data to the distribution, we always want to find out how good the data fits the distribution. So we're using the hypothesis test. In that case, the hypothesis of the fitted distribution represents data very well. And in that case, we also need to look for the p-value for the test. So the p-value for the test determines how good the test, uh, how uh, good the fit is. And if p-value is small, then it's a poor fit. And so if it's a poor fit, then we have to reject the hypothesis, but of course we could still make an error, right, even if we reject the hypothesis, we could be making tap one error. So to just illustrate this, here a uh, funny comics that shows you the type one error versus a type two error, and you can see here on t when the doctor makes a mistake and he tells the man, you're pregnant. Of course, a man cannot be pregnant, so the actual situation, right, is that that's a poor fit, um, but he says it's a good fit. Um, well, that's the way around, right? So he's making a top one error, which is a false positive, and in the other picture, you see type two error where you have the false negative, where the doctor tells the woman, no, you're not pregnant. So in reality, the woman is pregnant, but she's told that she's not pregnant. So again, this is just a comment, but it illustrates the difference between type 1 error and type 2 error. So now if you took, take a look at the hypothesis testing, you realize it's a lot like a criminal court system in the United States. How do we decide the guilt? First of all, we assume the innocence until proven guilty. And then the evidence is presented at trial, and the proof has to be made beyond a reasonable doubt. So the jury can make a, any of those two possible decisions, either guilty or not guilty. And so again, the jury cannot declare somebody innocent, right? They can just declare somebody not guilty. And that's important, right? Because we assume not that the person is not innocent. So in this case, assumption that the person is not innocent is a is our hypothesis. And then if if it's uh, well actually um, it's our hypothesis and we're, we're, while the guilty right is is the opposite, right? If we reject that then it's it's guilty. So does the jury ever make mistakes? If a person is really innocent, but the jury decides that the person is guilty, then they've sent an innocent person in jail, which might happen. Or if a person is really guilty, but the jury finds that person not guilty, a criminal is walking free on the streets. So, of course, in our criminal court system, type 1 error is considered more important than type 2 error. So we try to protect against the type 1 error to determ determine of type 2 error, and that's very similar in statistics. So the type 1 error is at well, significance level alpha, while type 2 error is the power of the test. So we, we're not worried right, about the type 2 error as much as we worry about type 1 error. So now if you look at um, how we determine um, the goodness of the fit, right, we actually have several tests, and one of them is chi-square test. 
So it allows us to figure out the goodness of the fit through the hypothesis testing. And so again, right, we assume that um, the fitted distribution is a, represents the data really well. And the alternative is that no, it doesn't represent data well. And so when we talk about the chi-squared, right, the formula is right here. That's the formula for chi-squared statistic. So you might want, you might be wondering what each of the values represent. So the n j n sub j is actually the number of data points in the j interval. So we split all, all different data points, right, in, in into k representative intervals, and then we look for the number points in the uh, in each interval. So that's a, point, a number of points in the interval, and we also look at the expected proportion of the data. So this pj, p sub j, is expected proportion of the data that would fall into the j interval if sampled from the fitted distribution. And altogether, we have a sample of size n. So the n here represents the size of the sample. And of course, if you split all the data points into k different intervals, then the summation of the n sub j's should be equal to n. So this chi-squared is an important statistic that allows us to reject our hypothesis that our distribution is a good fit if this chi-squared is too large. So if the chi-squared is too large, then the difference between what we observe and what we expect to observe is very, very large here. And so that also increases this difference, which basically tells us right, that this chi-squared is, is too large to be reasonably expected. And that, in that case, right, it's not very likely that that could happen. So we have to reject the hypothesis as being not very likely. Again, we can also use the p-value method, right? So we're rejecting h0 if x uh, or chi-squared is too large. And so we find the strengths of the evidence using the p-value. So from a future set of data, we compute the probabilities that x squared will be as large or even greater than x squared obtained from the current data. So if the p-value is very small, then either h0 is uh, false, right? Either our hypothesis is false, or we're just extremely unlucky, right? So we're not gonna think that we we just got this very unlucky draw. We more likely to think that you know, it's just a normal situation, but our hypothesis might be false. So the statistician will argue, right, that there is strong evidence against H0, and so the p-value is smaller than the pre-specified level, which called significance level, for example, 5%, then if that p-value is too small, then H0, our hypothesis, is rejected. And that's how the test works. So when you look at the p-value, right, the p-value, as you remember, is, as and in this specific case for our chi-squared, is the probability. And so you can visualize it as the area under the curve of the right tail of this chi-squared distribution. And so we talk about the chi-squared distribution um, as our um, comparison, right, which we compare the value of the statistic to the chi-square distribution. And the chi-square distribution has two parameters. Um, in the first parameter that is we're looking at k minus 1, and the second parameter is 1 minus alpha, right? So remember, we divided it into k different intervals. Those points are split into k different intervals. Um, similar to when we make a histogram, right, we also split our data into some intervals. So the, we're looking at the chi-squared with the parameters k minus 1 and then 1 minus alpha. And alpha here is that specified level, significance level for our test. And the significance level alpha, it represents the probability that area under the curve of the right tail 
of chi-square distribution with um, k k minus one degrees of freedom after the upper critical point x uh, or chi-squared k minus one one minus alpha. So if you look at this, right, the, these two pictures illustrate that, right? So you can see in this case we have the chi-squared and so we have the values for chi-squared and then a representative probability. So you can see that that is how the chi-squared distribution looks like and it's actually only the chi-squared only has the positive values because it's a sum of squared values. So it has to have positive, non-negative values. And then for different level of significance, right, is this um, upper uh, critical points we can determine, right? So we're looking at different different levels. And so this different level of significance is, is this area under the curve, right, that we have right here for our right tail is, is given here, right? That's the area. So that's also a level of significance. And based on that, right, we we can determine the critical values. So you can see that if we have this many degrees of freedom, right, um, four, right, so we choose degrees of freedom four, and then we change the level of significance to different levels. So this is actually level of significance. This is our degrees of freedom four. Then we have the corresponding critical values for each of the levels. So if we set our alpha to be 0 0.05 or 5%, right, so we're assuming that in in 5% uh, um, we might be making an error, right? Then we have significance level or 9.49. And so the alpha z, right, is connected to the um, the error, the first type one error. And you can also see here, right? That it also depends on the degrees of freedom. Right? What you see on the left hand side picture is for degrees of freedom 4. But if we vary degrees of freedom, the chi squared distribution also changes. So for 4, it's this green line right here. For 3 degrees of freedom, we get this red line right going here. And for 2, right, is this blue line. So you can see as degrees of freedom get smaller, right, we get a sharper curve. So now, right, when we're determining how representative uh, fitted distributions are for our data, the chi-square distribution is not the only distribution, right? There's also other tests exist that allows us to determine how well the fitted distribution represents observed data. And one of that we already mentioned um, when we talked about the input analysis we also talked about kalmogorov smirnov test. So you saw there is a KS statistic, right, that, or a KS test. That actually is the abbreviation for kalmogorov smirnov test. And so it's kind of similar because it also compares um, the two, uh, the uh, data, right, the hypothesized um, cumulative distribution function with the observed data. Right, or the observed uh, or empirical cumulative distribution function. So it actually is a range of applicability for this test is more limited than chi-squared tests, but also more conservative and less powerful, right? So it's not as sensitive to difference in tails. And there's another test, an alternative test that sometimes is better, is anderson Darling test. And that test is designed to detect discrepancies in the tails. So it's more powerful than kalmogorov smirnov test for many alternative uh, cumulative distribution functions. And so it's often preferred to kalmogorov smirnov if you really want to uh, have some sensitivity in terms of the difference in tails. And another thing, um, or another test that you could use is Poisson process test. Um, so, lab 5 is a useful thing that you can do, but there is also an uh, assignment that you can do either in class or at home that you saw on the slides. So, on the slides, you could work on um, 
analysis, right? And also, if you're working in pairs in class, you can compare your answers and discuss them. And so for that, you would need to use the data that you can download for um, lecture 13. And you can analyze the data file and answer some of the questions. So uh, let me go ahead, right? So this is some of the things that you could do. I'm just uh, show you some of the things that you can look at. You can read it on your own. And then I'll demonstrate uh, another thing that I wanted to show you that I haven't demonstrated in the previous lecture, lecture 12. So again, right, some of those things that yeah, I've shown you now is for you to practice. Or you can also do lab um, 5A, and that can prepare you as well for the quizzes. So uh, here, right, I, what I want to do is I want you to um, follow me along as I show you how to to do to deal with um, several data sets because we might be dealing with correlated data. So let me go ahead and demonstrate that. So recall that last time we worked with these uh, this data set, right, that had these um, values, integer values, and we want to look at some of these values. So let me go ahead and copy some of it. So I'm going to copy some of this data into an Excel file. And I will also have, so that's going to be my maximum data. And I'm also going to have a different file open and copy the file from there. So here I open a different file. And that's my file with minimums in there. And again, it's uh, kind of similar to the previous file that we saw, right? So that was a different file that we already copied. Now I want to copy from this file. And here I'm just going to go ahead and copy that. So let me just uh, go ahead and do that. So I'm going to control control A to select all the data and then control insert to copy them. And so you can see, right, it goes 2, 3, 2, 2. So I'm going to paste it here. And so you see 2, 3, 2, 2. And that's my min, min data. And so I have my max data and my min data. And I actually got those data from the same uh, experiment. So what I want to do is I want to figure out whether I can just assume that they are independent or do I need to um, do I need to do something different? What do I need to know? But I need to know whether they are correlated. So I could do it for example, right? I can do it in input analyzer but I could do that in uh, Excel. So I guess that correlation function and gives me correlation coefficient between two arrays so I can go ahead and select my array one Of course, we have a lot of data points here. So select this, and I similarly select this set. Or I could have selected them all together. Oops. 
So let me double check that I selected the correct set. So as you can see, I selected the correct set in both cases. And now this will tell me what the correlation is. So I can see, right, this is some slight correlation exists. So I need to be careful when I work with the data because they might actually be correlated. Right, and when I generate these data, I might want to make sure that I generate a correlated set and not uncorrelated set. So on this, I want to finish this lecture. So please go ahead and start working on uh, Lab 5A if you haven't done so.